so this is third lecture. We're going to talk about Hamel basis for vector spaces. Okay, so the basis for vector space, we call them Hamel basis, but for short term, we just call them basis. Okay, so we give a vector space, we have a subset, and the subset is a Hamel basis if first you're linearly independent and if you're contained B, so if it contains B and you're in, they're independent, then you're equal to B. So what that means is that it's the maximal linearly independent set. It's the maximal set. So if you're another linearly independent set such that you contain B, then you must be equal to B. Okay. So by theorem 2.2.8, we know that B is a basis, implies that B span B is N is equal to v because <coughs> we have to okay so we pick an x then b is not if b is not a subset of this but b is a basis so which means that this should be learning dependent then x should be in the span okay and x is in b so it's trivial to be in the span if you're not in B, you're in a span. If you're in B, you're in the span B trivial. So, so if you're a, if you're a basis, then you generate the vector space. Okay. So example, this is the basis for the trivial space. And more examples because just to let you guys know. Okay. So B is like this. E K were all like the the kth the kth. The kth coordinate ek is the center basis for fn and for any m times n matrix space we define each of those to be the center basis and this is the center basis for fx and now we have a theorem so if v is a vector space over f b is a subset of v then the following are equivalent v is the basis if and only if for any v so for any v, there exists blah 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 such that x is in this. So this already implies that span b is equal to v, right? And for any x in the span b, there exists unique elements, finitely elements, and non-zero um, field elements. They are distinct such that so the uh, vectors are distinct and the Scalars are non-zero such that x is the linear combination. Well, notice that this means that b is a basis if and only if it spans v and is linearly independent, right? If it spans v, so this spans v, and this condition is basically means that b is linearly, linearly independent, right? Linearly independent. So for this direction, this is a basis. Is it linearly independent? And span B is equal to V. Right? To find a V, right? Then by 2 for any X and V, there exists distinct such that is equal to this. And by 1, the expression is unique. So A implies B is trivial. And for B implies A, we need to do some work. So we're given span b is equal to v, right? This really means that we're given span b is equal to v. And I'll apply there in 2.2.4c, we know that it's linearly independent, okay? So we have it spans v and it's already linearly independent. Now we still have to check, oh, it's a maximum linearly independent set, right? If d contains b and d is linearly independent. So if this and this, First, we know that span D is equal to V because D contains B and B spans V, so does D, right? We, what we want to show that is D is the subset of V so that they're equal to each other. So we pick an element. So we, we pick an element that is D but not in B. So we wish to derive a contradiction here. And since we know that X is in span B because no matter what, you're in V, right? X is in V. Then... 2.2.a, we got b adjoint x is linearly dependent, okay? So if you're in a span and you adjoin x to this set b, then you're of course linearly dependent because 
x can be written as a linear combination of b, right? And b joint x is a subset of d, uh, d, right? Because x is in d, then we still got this. But by exercise 2.2.4, d is linearly dependent. So we have that this is dependent. And so this is linear dependent, and this contains this. This dependent implies that d is dependent, right? Which we get a contradiction, because d is assumed to be a linearly independent, which means that we can't have x in this set. So which means that d should be equal to b. And so it implies that b is a basis, OK? So if and only if it's a basis, and it's a basis if and only if it spans expands v and is linearly independent okay now theorem 1.7 says that oh v is a vector space and you have a finite spanning set for the vector space then you contain the basis so every spanning set can be reduced to a basis well this is really powerful so we're going to apply Exercise 2.2.5. And 2.5 says that, um, let me just go to 2.2.5. 2.2.5 exercise here. Show that we have, so we have a linear dependent. Dependent says that, such that, subset. Then we have a proper subset of S such that they span the same. Okay, so we're going to apply this. So if 0 is an S, we delete 0 from S. Otherwise, we leave it unchanged because if it's 0 in it, it, it won't contribute anything to the span, right? Now, step 0 is that if S is linearly independent and span S and V, then blah, 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 right? Such as this. Then by above theorem, right? S is a basis. Now, if s is linearly dependent then by this we have a proper subset such that they span the same now so for this s zero is linearly independent then we repeat z step zero we just sub s is not in it then blah 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 we got s not as a basis right now if s not is linearly dependent then we repeat this step then we get another like s one proper sub s not Right, and and we repeat. If we finally reach some S n such that it contains exactly one element, then if you're a singleton set, we know that there exists a scalar such that kv is equal to zero and v is not zero. If we have this, then it implies k is equal to zero. So S n is linearly independent. So. If we have a scalar such that kv is equal to zero, but v is non-zero, why v is non-zero? Because, right? Now, v is non-zero implies k is equal to zero. So here's the proof. If k is not zero, then every field has this multiplicative inverse, right? Then we got one v equals v equals to zero, but we assume v is not zero, so we get a contradiction. So k must be zero, which means that as in linear independent, and they span the same by our process, then Sn is a basis because, right, you're independent and you span the, the vector space, then you're a basis. And we have this, right? So no matter what, we have a, we contain, we contain the basis for B, okay? Okay. So some examples, the set of all polynomial with degree at most two, where each coefficients are rationals, is a vector space over Q. And notice that this set spans Q to X, and these two sets are bases. Okay, you can verify it on your own. And B1, B2 are a subset of S. But notice that they all have three elements. They have the same amount of elements. So this is kind of sus, right? We want to explore what's going on behind. 
Now, which leads to this lemma? If V is a vector space, S is a spanning set, so you have n elements, we'll let L be another set such that it is linearly independent. Then, we have M, and M is strictly le uh, less than or equal to N. M is less than or equal to N, and there exists a subset of S such that it contains N minus M elements, such that L, a joint with this H, both together, it spans V. So, L borrow elements, borrow some elements from S, such that you take their union, they, you got a spanning set. Okay? So this is one more proof. And our proof is going to use induction. So first, M, if the base case is that with M is equal to zero, then we know that empty set is linearly independent, right? And A, B are trivial, because if M is zero, zero is less than equal to all N, right? This is, of course, this is like trivial. And we just let then h is just equal to s, right? It, we just get this set, n minus 0, right? s1, s2, sn, as an s such that the empty set adjoined with s is equal to s, s spans v. We're given that s spans v, so it's trivial to check. Now, suppose that m is equal to k is true, we want to prove the case when m is equal to k plus 1. Now, notice that we let l Okay, linear independence, and because this spans V, then S contains a basis of V. Now, let's just delete this. We delete this to apply our inductive hypothesis, right? So we let LK plus 1 equals to this set, deleting this last element. And this is linearly independent, right? Because this is linearly independent, then your subset should also be linearly independent. It's again, by the exercise question. Right, then we know that there exists h minus k such that it spans v. So why k plus 1, this element, can be expressed as a combination of elements from 1 to k and all the h1 to h minus k. A I Y I U I H I. So those are field elements and those are elements from the set. Because we know that L is linearly independent, right? So H should be non empty. Because if this is empty set, if we don't have elements, then we have Y K plus 1 is a linear combination of them. And be, well, why k plus 1 cannot be 0, because if you, if, it, if a set contains 0 elements, then you're not linearly uh, independent, okay? So, so, with that being said, we must have h is non-empty, right? Otherwise, you're just, you're just in the span of, of this set. Well, this implies that L itself is linearly dependent, so h is non-empty, right? Otherwise, L is dependent. So we have n minus k is greater than 0. So this should be at most one element. Which we arrange this n is greater than equal to k plus 1 because we're talking about integers. Okay? Now, if all ui are equal to 0, if all these equal to 0, we get a contradiction. Right, again, if all this equals zero, then y k plus one is a linear combination of elements on this. So we just, without logic generality, would assume that u1 is non zero. And we replace h1 with y k plus one. Okay, we replace h1 with y k plus one. Because, look, then this set gener still generates v. Okay, so here's the explanation. Since this spans v, right, by inductive hypothesis, this spans v, and h1 is just, so we have y k plus 1 is equal to this plus this plus this, then we can isolate h1, okay, we isolate h1, we got this, so it doesn't really matter, but we isolate h1, then notice all these elements, 
H1 is in the span of L union H and not H1, right? Because we don't have H1 included. You start from 2. You know what I'm saying? So, so with this construction, anything, this still generates V. Because if you're involving H1, if you're in, like given el any elements in the span of this set, if the linear combination involves H1, I mean, uh, if so any span of this, if you're involving H1, we just replace H1 by this. So this still generates V. Okay? So we've already proven this and we now delete H1 from H, so H has N minus K plus one elements. Okay? So you still have N minus K and now you have N minus K plus one elements. Okay, so the by induction the theorem follows. Okay, so so here we got a corollary. So if V is not a zero a vector space over F with finite basis that contains mu elements, then every basis has mu elements. Maybe. more rigorous now we just let B be the given basis and we let a M be another basis of V then we have M less equal to mu and mu less equal to M which gives M is equal to U we're basically just applying this given those conditions because if your basis then you span V and you're also linear independent so you're just interchanging and you got you got M less than equal to mu and mu again less than equal to m. So, with that being said, the v vector space is fine dimensional. Let b be a basis with n elements. Then we say the dimension of v is denoted as this is equal to n, because any basis has same number of elements, which means that the the definition of dimension of V is well defined. So V is finite dimensional if we have a finite basis. Okay? The dimension of V is this. Otherwise V is infinite dimensional if you don't have any finite basis. Okay? So here we have dimension of zero because it empty says a basis. And dimension of this is n, the, this is n plus 1, and this is m times n. And the dimension of complex numbers over complex number is 1, because for any 1, right, just multiply, if you want a plus bi, you just multiply a plus b1 to 1. There you got a plus bi, so dimension of 1. 1 is the basis. And dimension of c over r is 2, because... 1 and i are basis for c over r, right? If you want a plus bi, then you got a times 1 plus b times i. So the dimension is 2. And the dimension of c over rationals are infinite dimensional vector spaces. So here's the justification. So 1 is the basis for c over c, and 1 is the basis for c over r, but suppose for a contradiction that we have a finite basis for c over q. Then for every z, can be written as some linear combination of this. Well, n tuples are q, so we're giving just like, we're just, we're just saying like we're having n tuples of q, right? Those q's are from the field q, right? n tuples of q, but n tuples of q are countable. But complex number is uncountable because because R is uncountable. And R it can view as a subset of C. Uh it can be viewed as a subset of C. Because C is defined as R squared, right? C is really just R equipped. C is just order pair. If you you can define 
the order PR R, but the operations, the field operations R C are quite different. Okay, so some new corollary. Now if we have a finite dimensional vector space, then for any subset of V, if you spans V, then your cardinality should greater than N. You have more than N elements. If it's equal to N, then you're a basis. For any linearly independent subset, your cardinality should less than equal to N. If you're equal to N, then you're a basis. Well, C means that every linearly independent subset of L of V can be extended to a basis. Okay? Any linearly independent subset of L can be extended to a basis. So, to prove, we first we give a basis of V so that our proof uh, can use this basis so far uh, along the way. Now, we know that for part A, we know that S contains a basis if you're spanning V, right? Then you're containing a basis, which means that S is greater equal to N because every basis should have N elements, right? Now, if you're equal to n, then again, s contains a basis. But this tells us that each basis has n elements. So s itself is a basis. So what you mean that is that, okay, if you have n elements, then we know that you must contain a basis. And this basis cannot be strictly contained in S, because otherwise you have less than n elements. But every basis must have n elements, right? So we cannot delete anything, which means that S itself is a basis. Now B, if L is linearly independent, then we know that L is less than equal to n. So little 1.9 part A. Here's one. Okay. Yeah, so this is what it says. If you're linearly independent, you have, you are a basis, so you generate v, right? You, b spans v, b spans v, and l is linearly independent. Then we know that this is less than equal to n, right? Now, if it's equal, then we know that part b is that there exists empty set. Right, because there exist n minus n elements, such so that b such that this spans v, well then l spans v, which means that l is a basis because you're linear independent and you spans v, then you are a basis. So c is really just b. Okay, so this is actually wrong. It's not a valid proof. Um, I just realized. Okay. So let's prove it again. So um, okay, I'll just add a new page and prove part C. Okay. So every linear independent can be extended to a basis. We want to prove this. So first we have a claim. So given, okay. Mm, so given L, let's say um, L uh, V V one V M, linearly independent. So we know that if M is equal to N, M is equal to N. There's nothing to prove, right? If it's equal to n, we're done. Now, m cannot be greater than n because your dimension is n, right? So suppose that m is less than n. Now, we note that the span of L is not equal. It's the strictly contained mv. So let me tell you why. Because if if your span is equal to V, then you're linearly independent, right? But this means that you're a basis, but you have less than N elements and your dimension is N. 
so you must be strictly contained which means I will pick in we pick we pick in w that is in v but not in the span of w the span of l now we adjoin we adjoin this is linearly independent here's the claim right so proof maybe just prove it so why is it linearly independent because suppose we have a1 v1 am vm plus uh a r nah, m plus one w is equal to zero okay so we want to show that all of them are equal to zero all the coefficients but let's just suppose for a contradiction that this is not zero then we can divide am am plus one vm equals to negative w and we just move the negative sign over there right we just move the negative sign over there well this means that it's in the span span of l we get a contradiction right so you are linearly independent so after you're linearly independent and then we check oh and now we check we check if this spans v right if it does if it does then we got a basis right if it doesn't we add more elements we just keep adding elements such that it is a basis of v so you see okay so buff okay it's not we pick an element that is not in a span and we'll see if this spans v because we know that they're in lin linearly independent if it does not span v then we pick another element right so we're like using axioms of choice over and over again right okay let's just move on so now the theorem if you're finite dimensional and if you're a subspace subspace then this subspace is also a finite dimensional vector space with your dimension less than to this dimension if your dimension happens to be the same then you are the same vector space as v so let's prove the first one if it's the infinite dimensional then no finite span no finite set spans w so does v so v is infinite dimensional we get a contradiction which means that w is a finite dimensional vector space okay now we let b a basis of w with finite elements then b is linearly independent and w so does is in v because w is a sub subset then we can ex uh, then we know that the cardinality is less than or equal to n right this is what we, what we have right less than or equal to n now if is equal to n then your basis of v so w is span b and span b is equal to v it's a basis of v so this and this because b is a basis of w so they're the same Okay, this concludes the proof. Now we have a new proposition. So we let V be a vector space over a field. We let YZ be finite dimensional subspace of V. Y plus Z denotes the set of all elements from Y plus the set of elements from Z and it, its result. So the set of all such sum is a finite subspace. And their dimension is have this formula. Now if V is equal to Y plus Z, then y, V is the internal sum if and only if this is true okay internal direct sum i believe so if it's finite subspace we know that this is finite subspace of y and z 
because y and z are finite dimensional vector spaces and y intersect z is a subspace of y and z right you can perform the subspace test easily to show that oh yeah indeed right because we have shown that oh that all the all of this is a vector space, right? It's a subspace. Now we just let this be a basis of y intersect z. And then we extend this to a basis of y and we extend this to a basis of z. Now, so all of them, the u's, y's, and z's is a basis of y plus z. So this is our claim. Now, so to prove this, since this contains y and z, right? Their span contains y and z, right? We have this. So it actually equals to y plus z, right? Because any element y is in the span and any element z is in the span. So any element of y plus z is also in the span, right? And all the elements in this span is, of course, in, in y plus z. So nothing to prove. <laughs> And we suppose that, so we want to show that there are, so they already spans y plus z. So we want to show that they're linearly independent. So we suppose we have scalars such that, oh, they all add up to zero. Then we isolate this, we got this, is in y, right? Because this is in the span of, right? But all the z i's are in z. So this thing is really in y and in z, which means that for this element, we have a basis for it. So we got a unique linear combination, right? We got this, some uk. But all those elements are linearly independent in z. So if you just arrange them over there, arrange them over there, and they will add up equal to zero. So, which means that all these scalars should be zero. And we substitute back. All the z's are zero, right? So all the z's are zero. Then we got these equal to zero. But those are what? Basis for z. So they are linearly independent, which means that all the a's are equal to zero. B's. So all the a, i, and b, j's are equal to zero. So what we now have, they are a basis for y plus z. And how many elements do you have? k plus n plus n, right? It's k plus n plus n. Then we have, we just add k and subtract k. So we go this plus this minus k, which proves a is in b, right? Because they have this much elements and minus k which is the dimension of this, okay? So it proves A and B, A and B. A and B are all both proven at the same time. So now we want to prove C. Given this, so if we have this is equal to this, which means the dimension of this is equal to zero, then their intersection is just a zero ve vector. So it's an internal direct sum. If it's internal direct sum, then we know that, then we know this, then we know this. Uh, so it's kind of trivial, right? So we have a more proposition. I believe it's the last one, last two proposition, and we're done. So if you're finite dimensional vector space and you have a subspace, then you exist a subspace of V such that V is the equal to the internal sum. So this is kind of good property, right? So find the dimensional vector space and you're given any subspace, then you have another subspace such that V is the internal sum. So we pick basis of Y. We pick basis of Y, then we can extend. We can extend to basis of V, right? Now we consider the span of those extended elements. We define the span is equal to Z. The span is a subspace, okay? Proven in the first lecture, and it's a subspace of V. So we want to show that it's equal to this. And 
their intersection is zero. First equation is trivial to see, right? Because what was the basis spans v, then it's trivial to see. So we want to look at the second condition. So we pick an element in this set. So we want to show that x is equal to the zero vector, which means that this is a subset of zero. And clearly, we have zero as a subset of this. So we just want to show that x is equal to the zero vector. So now we have this. And we have this. Because you're in y, then you have linear combination, and you have b, and you're in z, you have another linear combination. Now, we do subtraction is equal to zero, right? But they are a basis, which means that all the a and the uj is equal to zero. So those are canceled out, which means x is just zero vector, which concludes our proof. And we know that the set z is called a complement of y. Okay, so the z is given y, then this existed z is called a complement of y. So they both add up equal to give us the, the big vector space. Okay, now for w be a subspace of v, finite dimensional vector space, we have a basis of w, then we can extend it to a basis of v, right? Then we first, we have those sets, so those extended set plus w is a basis for the quotient space. And dimension v is equal to dimension of w plus the dimension of v divided by w, the quotient space. Okay. So the proof, we just check condition one by one. First, we pick an element, v is in v. Then v can express as a linear combination of those elements, right? The v plus w, we apply our operation defined on cosets. And because all those a, i, u, i are in w, right? We have a basis of w. So when they add up, it gives you, it gives you back w for cosets operations. So really what's left out is those terms, right? So all those vanishes equal to w, zero plus w, and they vanish, right? And then we again perform our operation defined on cosets on quotient space, we have this, which means that this spans this, right? So now we want to show that they're linearly independent. So suppose that we have this add up equal to the zero, i.e. we have this equal to zero plus w. Then we know that this is in w. So this two, co um, two cosets are equal if and only if. So a plus w equals to b plus w equivalent to a minus b is in w, right? So we have this minus zero, which is this, is in w. Now, we have a basis of w, remember? So now you can see the answer. We just pick this, and we argue by they are a basis to their linear independent, so the coefficient should all be equal to zero, which means that if this is equal to zero, that all those or all those are equal to zero, which means that they're linearly independent. This proves A, and B follows by A, because, look, B is the consequence of A. You have, you have N elements, so here you have N elements, right? Your K, you have K to N as a basis of V, dimension, gives you a dimension. This is K, and the rest add up to V, right? So, it's trivial. So this concludes the animal basis section, and for next lecture, we're going to talk about infinite dimensional vector spaces.